morning and welcome to our PwC Boardroom Forum live uh, talk show. Uh, we are now running our second series on the topic of corporate reporting and today's session is really going to be ESG focused. Uh, where we're going to talk a little bit about the accounting considerations for sustainability linked loans or green loans. Joining me in conversation this morning is PwC Corporate Reporting Services Partner and Banking Industry Specialist Natasha Sumai. Uh, welcome Natasha. I'm quite eager to hear what you have to share this morning around uh, the sustainability linked loans. But before we kick off on some of the accounting considerations, I think let's just start us all on a level playing field and help us to understand what is a green loan and how would a party um, you know, that has issued or acquired a green loan actually identify that they've done so? Thank you, Taruna. I'm very pleased to be here to talk about such a relevant topic. ESG, also known as environmental, societal and governance issues, have been a focus area over the past two to three years. And naturally, this has garnered a lot of attention from various industry setting bodies, regulators, investors, as well as stakeholders. Now, an area that I'm quite involved in are green loans. Um, and green loans is really just an umbrella term to describe loans which a funder might advance to a party to help with sustainable initiatives or loans that have cash flows that might vary with ESG related metrics or sustainability linked metrics. Mm. Now, generally where you have a loan that varies with or cash flows vary with matrices, it's quite tricky to account for these. But I think it's, it's less tricky for parties to understand whether they've actually entered into a green loan because generally the parties to the arrangement will understand why they've entered into a loan as well as how the pricing of that, that loan works. Mm. Now that's, that's interesting, Natasha. I guess maybe for you an obvious question, but um, you know, from an accounting perspective, is the accounting for green loans something that just lenders should be concerned with? That's a very good question, Taruna. I think there's been so much of focus on the lender's accounting mm. that sometimes the other party to the transaction, it, there's a bit of uncertainty whether it's as complicated or not. But I think, I mean, the reality with all contracts is there's more than one party to the contract. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in our local environment, we've seen the banks or financial institutions being both the borrower as well as the lender in the arrangement. And where the bank is the lender, the corporate is generally the borrower. So both parties need to assess, in my mind, you know, what the crux of the clauses to the contract are and why they've been included. And where you have these sustainability linked features in the contract, you're not really understanding what's the commercial rationale for including it in the contract as well as understanding the consequences of including it so that there's no unwarranted accounting consequences later on. Mm. So, so perhaps Natasha in reading you know, uh, around some of these green loans, I think this concept that I noticed around variability seems to come up quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Help us to understand you know, what does, uh, from a variability perspective, what are some of the examples that we've seen in practice and, and really why is this concept important? Yeah. So variability is definitely the catchphrase that introduces the complexity in the accounting. I mean, globally as well as locally, some of the, the variable linked features that we've seen is, um, you know, how a borrower performs against greenhouse gas emissions, um, water saving initiatives, and then more from a, a governance and social angle is matrices which are linked to employees' ethnicity or gender diversity. And as you can imagine, at the time of entering into a contract where you have cash flows that vary with these features, it's quite difficult to actually assess how much cash the borrower is going to outlay over the life of this loan because there's uncertainty as to how the borrower is actually going to perform against these matrices. And that's what makes it quite complicated. Mm. No, I mean, I think you've certainly highlighted some of the complexity, you know, specifically, I guess, from a lender's perspective as well. Um, so, you know, what aspects would you say uh, boards and management should be focusing on um, if they are actually lenders in these types of transactions? 
Yeah, I think the lenders accounting has definitely been a highlight. And I mean, certainly for us as a firm, we've spent a lot of time globally and locally debating the various accounting complexity. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes the lenders accounting a little bit more tricky is that when the financial instrument standard was released, mm -hmm. ESG was not a hot topic back then. To be honest, it was not even on the radar. Mm. So we are now trying to fit existing accounting guidance um, or, or these type of loans into existing accounting guidance. Mm -hmm. and, and you can imagine the diversity that might uh, arise from that. But I think, I mean, the first judgmental bit is really how to classify these loans on the face of the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, existing accounting literature provides for three types of classification being amortized cost, fair value through other comprehensive income, as well as fair value through profit or loss. And in assessing why getting this classification correct is so important is that this drives your measurement. And obviously your measurement drives what hits your income statement mm. and causes the volatility in your income statement. Now, there's two things that we would generally look at from a lender's perspective, and that is the business model, as well as the contractual cash flows in this contract and whether those contractual cash flows meet payments which are solely payments of principal and interest, also known as the SPPI test. Now generally with the business model assessment, it's a bit easier to do because we've got established principles in the accounting literature, so we don't foresee a lot of complexity in that regard. I think where we are going to see complexity is where you've got sustainability linked features in the contract mm. that causes your cash flows to vary and whether that actually meets SPPI or not will be a key driver then as to how this contract's classified. Mm. So this SPPI element does sound like quite a critical component in terms of your assessment of the classification and measurement of your green loans. So just help us to understand, Natasha, uh, what are some of the factors that should be considered when you're completing this assessment? I think the first myth to probably dispel is if you've got sustainability linked features, you automatically fail SPPI. Mm -hmm. I think if you're getting to that conclusion, then you're probably going down the wrong path. Um, I think for me, the, the crux of the, the SPPI test is really whether the changes in the cash flows in the contract is commensurate with credit risk, because we know that interest is supposed to compensate the lender for credit risk. Mm -hmm. So where you have changes that are, that are commensurate with this credit risk, it would then meet the SPPI criteria. Now, in theory, this sounds very simple, mm. but there is a substantial amount of evidence that needs to go into actually demonstrating this. But I think to maybe highlight three things which we would, we would look out for is, you know, where you have these changes to your cash flows, is this change compensating you for a higher, lower probability of default, or is it compensating you for the fact that you might suffer a higher, lower loss on default? that would then be more akin to an instrument that meets SPPI. I think the second consideration is the magnitude of the change. Because when the cash flows change, that magnitude needs to be representative of a change that's commensurate with credit risk, and you shouldn't be introducing leverage into that. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is where your interest rates can change in various directions that change in all directions must be commensurate with changes in credit risk. Mm. And, and perhaps some of uh, you know, our audience watching think to themselves, this, this is a very complex area. So you know, is there so, some sort of a materiality threshold that can be applied in, in performing this assessment? So is there that t type of a consideration when assessing SPPI? Uh, for example, if the impact of the feature is not material, then you, know, then you don't um, have to consider what the impact is on your assessment. So we don't have a materiality threshold when assessing SPPI, but we do have a concept called de minimis. Mm -hmm. And what the accounting literature says at the moment is that if a feature is de minimis or it's non-genuine, then you disregard it in your SPPI okay. analysis. I think I, I would caution 
on automatically getting to a de minimis assessment because generally these contracts are entered into between unrelated third parties. Right. So there's generally commercial rationale for why it's been included in the contract. And then I guess the second area is where you generally see green loans, there's, uh, there's a lot of hype around green loans mm. in investor presentations, integrated reports. And if we, if we are making a hype in the front part of your financial statements or in the front half of your, your financial results, it seems a bit inconsistent to then conclude that it's de minimis when you get to your financial statements. Mm. So I think it's just really making sure that the reporting is achieving consistency across the board. Mm. And, and Natasha, from a practical perspective, a loan now meets SPPI. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Yeah, that's a very good <laughs> question. Um, I think SPPI has been the focus of our discussion today. And, and like I mentioned earlier, SPPI really drives how you measure this loan. Mm. Now, I think it doesn't matter which of your measurement categories you, you fall into. There are going to be complexities that, that come with that. But I guess where you meet SPPI, you can then classify that loan either at amortized cost or at fair value through other comprehensive income, depending on what your business model is doesn't come without its challenges though because where you are scoped into those measurement categories you then fall into the impairment model mm. of the accounting standards and um, the impairment model requires you to take into account historical current as well as future forward-looking information into your model mm. and and one might then need to build how these ESG metrics are going to move in the future into existing models which might require additional resources and modeling, which board should be cognizant of. Mm. And I think depending on how these cash flows change and how frequently they change, if the cash flows are not representative of a market interest rate, mm -hmm. you might have additional um, P&L or additional income statement volatility for catch up adjustments that you need to do as and when the cash flows change. Mm. If you fail SPPI, you then under the fair value through profit or loss category, meaning that you have to measure the instrument at fair value, mm -hmm. and all changes in that fair value go through income statement. So, you know, immediately if that's volatile, Volatility you're going to again. have a very <laughs> volatile income statement until the end of life of that loan. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think it's been so useful to understand some of the principles from the lender's perspective. I mean, if you're a borrower in this particular transaction, can you help us to understand what some of the impacts are? Okay, so if you're on the borrower side, you've got a liability now, no longer the asset. Mm -hmm. So the complex SPPI principles we spoke of do not really apply here. Instead, from the borrower's side, you need to look at whether those matrices are an embedded derivative so we're going into other complicated <laughs> accounting areas. But I mean, for something to be an embedded derivative, it has to meet the definition of a derivative. And um, that's where you've got cash flows that fluctuate either with a market related factor or if it's, or sorry, a financial factor, mm -hmm. or if it's non-financial, the non-financial factor must be specific to a party to the arrangement. Now, I think what we've observed is that in a lot of cases, these matrices are non-financial. And in most cases, they are specific to the borrower to give commercial rationale to these transactions. So in most of the cases, we see that actually there is an embedded derivative, but it actually doesn't meet the definition of a derivative, even though there is a fluctuation, mm -hmm. because it is specific to a party in the contract. But I think similar to the lender, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer, and you need to carefully assess what those features are and whether it is actually specific to the party or not. Mm. No, absolutely fascinating, uh, Natasha. Um, you know, you mentioned a little earlier um, that we have accounting standards that are already in place, and we're almost trying to retrofit now into our existing standards. Um, so from your perspective and what you've seen, are we expecting any amendments to existing accounting standards for ESG features? I'm quite pleased to say yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the International Accounting Standards Board 
um, started a post-implementation review of the financial instrument standards about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And there was, I think, unanimous comment letters which um, you know, just highlighted the complexity of accounting for ESG loans and the need for more guidance because there will be diversity in practice around this. And I think the boards acknowledge that although we do have guidance at the moment, um, they, it, it would be helpful to provide a little bit more guidance in this area. Mm -hmm. So we're currently working on an exposure draft which has been issued by the boards and I think the comment period ends the 19th of July, 2023. So we can expect to see some additional guidance in, I guess, how you look at interest, uh, where you have ESG matrices, as well as where you've got contingent events, which causes interest to change, um, how to actually consider whether that still meets SPPI or not, mm -hmm. and some additional examples um, there's also some proposed changes to disclosures to help users understand how the impact or what the impact of these features actually are in the financials. So I guess it's still an exposure draft, so there's still a comment period. So what ultimately ends up in the guidance will be dependent, I guess, on response letters and further discussions. Mm -hmm. But I think from our discussion today, I mean, I, I, this is clearly such an evolving space. Um, and so I, I guess from your perspective, just reflecting on, on what we've covered today, are there any closing comments that you want to share with the audience? Definitely. I think the one item we always leave last for discussion is disclosure, mm. but it, <laughs> it really um, demands some of our attention. Yeah. I think there's a lot of estimation and judgment that goes into these areas from the discussions that we've had today, which needs to make its way into the financial statements where you've got um, impairment modeling for ESG related factors as well as disclosures around things like liquidity risk um, becomes quite important. I think the other angle is determining fair values might not be that simple because it's also an evolving area mm. and there might be a lot of unobservable information that you need to take into account in determining fair value because it's borrower specific information which makes it more difficult and a lot more disclosure is then required. I think I'd also urge um, all interested users of financial statements and preparers to take a look at the exposure draft mm -hmm. and, and I guess feedback to the bodies that are responsible for commenting to the boards as to our recommendations, agreements or disagreements with the exposure draft as well. Mm. No, uh, thank you, Natasha. I mean, you've covered so much ground in this short conversation. I think we've really um, you know, dug into some of the accounting consequences of your sustainability link loans or your green loans. Um, you know, I think you've, you've shared such great guidance from a lender and a borrower's perspective and also given us some insight into where the accounting standards are expected to go in future. So I think it's been very insightful for me, uh, a pleasure to, to have a chat to you as well. And I hope the session's been useful, um, you know, to those individuals who are viewing it. Uh, we look forward to, to hosting uh, you on future sessions and also, uh, you know, to the further topics that will be covered as part of this corporate reporting series. So thank you so much. Thank you.